uh, Adam Forshaw of Great College. Um, so you've spoken a lot about the research that you've done into mm -hmm. the results of not getting mental health support yeah. and what can happen with it. Have you done much research in like the causes of all these uh, mental health problems? So, for example, the causes why there was eight suicides at Bristol yeah. uh, in that year as opposed to maybe ten years ago. Yeah. Are we seeing the main trends with yeah. that? I mean, I mean, no, I think that's a good question. I, I think one of the key trends we're seeing is where there is areas where provision is lacking, people are deteriorating to such a point. So, for example, when we did um, research, for example, into uh, A&E and, and these different areas, please, the general areas in which you know, things were getting worse and people were ending up in these, these positions um, was because there was a lack of investment in that particular area. And one of the key bits of research we're actually doing now is looking into how much provision, um, how much money, sorry, CCGs, uh, clinical commission groups, are actually giving to each particular area to try and join it up and look at that. But I think when it comes to universities um, like Bristol, there needs to be a lot more investment. And in my personal opinion, there needs to be a lot more joined up, a joined up approach. So it's not just left to the university to deal with it, but actually local NHS trusts and local enterprises and local charities playing a part within that process. I hope that answers your question. Joe Ross Bills, I'm afraid I don't have a college. Um, <laughs> you've pitched your argument to appeal yeah. to a wide swathe of the political yeah. spectrum. But there is another side, the mm. biodeterminist side. Mm. Ten billion pounds is a lot of money, and we've tried a lot of these social interventions, and they're very difficult mm. to, to make stick. Mm. What do you think to one very interesting proposal I read about? But one of the things behind the apparent surge in mental health issues is that we're not getting the minerals we used to from water from wells. What do you think to the proposition that we could spike the groundwater with lithium? No comment. Um, no, I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I've got to be honest with you, I don't, I don't really know about spiking water with lithium. Um, but what I would say is, actually, uh, there hasn't actually been a lot on, in mental health, this sort of intervention. Mental health's always been the, the Cinderella service of the NHS, and it's always been lagging in funding. And in times of austerity, um, which I'm not saying is a good or a bad thing, mental health services obviously being the poorest hasn't loses money which inevitably has seen a rise in quite a lot of these situations i'm not saying money's money's the only option to look at there's, there's a also a responsibility um to look at other areas and not just money as a simple solution i'm not saying that but in mental health i think actually by because if we ring fence this money in a particular area for example in uh, children, adolescent, early intervention services, the likelihood is people who get help quicker, or people who have more variety of treatments, are never going to get help um, healthy quicker, which are never really going to be not ending up in, in situations such as on welfare or costing the economy huge amounts of money um, from that. So yeah, but I don't know about the mineral water. Can't comment that. Um, well, Michelle Rick Davis from Catholic Society. Um, so, mental health, obviously, in terms of NHS policy, current policy for certainly issues, especially surrounding anxiety and stress, which have been the, one of the major, obviously, universities linked to one of the major conditions linked to suicides, linked to um, dropouts. Current NHS policy on it um, only refers mainly to the prescription of medication. Um, your average clinical GP can't refer you to a counselling service, having sort of worked in welfare mm. myself, when you actually look at the effectiveness of what is basically allowed is drug prescriptions, for a simple yeah. way to put it. Um, the current approach is that in the same way that if you have a flu or a cold, they mm. use a prescribed paracetamol, um, SSRIs can be prescribed. To what extent do you think this is truly effective, um, and what would you say in terms of potentially linking counselling services to GPs or something? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I'm not... I know there's been a lot recently about uh, whether antidepressants actually work. Um, I think one psychologist called it a piece of chalk. Uh, listen, I, I think when it comes to medication, I think it's an individual thing. 
I think for some people SSRIs um, that you alluded to can be really useful for some people, but I think others they're not so useful for. And this is where mental health is such an individual thing. Um, um, regarding counselling services, the problem is there isn't any counselling services, um, to be completely blunt. I mean, if you're talking on, talking on a university campus, I know in certain campuses they've got facilities um, like this. I mean, one of uh, the best treatment will always be from a trained psychologist or psychiatrist. It's, it's a no-brainer. If you can't access them services, and you're literally being put on medication, you're being given a crutch for you know, a long period of time. And eventually there's got to be some level of intervention. Because as soon as you get taken off that medication, you know, what, what, what's going to happen? So I, I think when it comes down to this, I think uh, psychological therapies need to be invested in. Uh, more psychological therapies need to be researched. And um, yeah, and we need to we need to look at that. But I don't think medication on its own. I wouldn't recommend medication on its own as a as a complete you know, a recovery plan. Hear that. Uh, um, when it comes to you mentioned education is very important to so people understand about mental health and so they can help in the future, like um, and sort of help each other. What specifically? From an investment point of view, do you think it would be the best way forward in that, like that sort of mm. course at schools or? Um, yeah. yeah. No, that's a good question. I, I mean, as as part of the mental partnership, I think there's a there's a feeling at the moment that actually, I don't know why they didn't realise this before, but teachers aren't actually fully trained in mental health. They can't. They're not psychologists. They're not psychiatrists. Um, they can't give the correct advice or can on a very basic level. So this is why we need to join up with local charities, such as, um, you know, and I, the reason I say local is because they'll know the area, but uh, local charities which can help provide resources available to young people and help educate them on the different mental illnesses, um, would help educate them on how to maintain good well-being. I'm not talking about something that's going to be, you know, I'm not saying we should replace maths with, you know, uh, CBT for beginners, but what I am saying is actually on a very, very basic level, we need to start putting this into the curriculum because, you know, if, if I was, God forbid, education minister, I'd be thinking, looking at this, I'd say, I actually want standards to improve. What's the solution? Well, the solution is to teach pupils how to deal with exams instead of actually saying, let's you know, put extra stress on them and make them suffer a little bit more. I, I, I think there's a lot There's a lot we can do, but on a basic level, I think it's about helping individuals understand mental health at a basic level and how to support their mental health. And that means that the next generation will have the education to support the next generation. So that's what I do think. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, uh, Stephanie, Colby, Thank you. So I'm just a psychologist. Yeah. Um, I, I researched yesterday about most involved young victims. Yeah. And they cannot access the um, be reliability of psychiatrist and diagnosis. Mm. Do you think if we become too attentive to this kind of well baby issues to students, mm. those well trained psychiatrists come to the campus and to try to do counseling with students, mm. do you think the students kind of being too obsessed with the stress and kind of overthinking about this issue mm. and end up being really um, Thinking themselves being serious with this yeah. mental health issue, but actually they're not really because yeah. you know you tend to think this kind of issue too much. And yeah, no, no, I, definitely. I mean, listen, there's a reason we've got something as, as you'll be aware of the DSM, yes. um, which is obviously the diagnosis um, book that every psychologist seems to have. And it pretty much tells you how to diagnose someone with a particular mental health disorder. Um, I think mental health has become, people have become more aware and it's become more socially acceptable to talk about mental health, which is fantastic. But due to that, there's more people coming out and talking about it. And this can suddenly uh, gain a societal panic in which people suddenly think, well, actually I have that. 
No, so I must have that. Um, when actually it's, it's not so much that. I, I think the issue is that what I'm alluding to is the people who really do need the help are actually not getting the help. And that is leading to these particular issues. But I think that's causing like a, a societal panic as well around does my kid suffer this or does my kid not suffer this, which is probably bunging up the services even more than it needs to be because people are thinking, oh, my child needs to go and see a psychologist. Um, it's very hard to go against, but I think the more education you get and the more support you get on how to deal with things like stress during exam times or dealing with anxiety, the more support you give to everyone, it means that everyone will be caught uh, within that bubble and it means that people will be able to support themselves instead of always reaching um, out to services. Although, if you really do need support, please do reach out to services. I wouldn't obviously go against that. I'm sure you'll make a fantastic... Do you want to be a clinical psychologist, is it? Um, no. No? Oh. Right, okay, right. We've got a shortage there, just to let you know. More. But yeah, you'd be brilliant, I'm sure. Uh, Dan, I was on St. Lady's College. Um, so you've talked about how sort of education mm. getting people aware of it. Um, what are your thoughts on perhaps having a uh, mental health equivalent of a school that's in most schools? Yeah, and, and I think that's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a good idea, but I think the problem with that, and this is, I'm starting to sound very conservative here, but the problem with that is that it costs a lot of money. I'm trying to go to a, you know, go to the treasury and say, actually, we need a mental health nurse in every single school in the country. That's going to cost. They're going to say no. Um, but then, secondly, also the issue with that is, you know, where do you draw the line? Do we need a, a one in every single year? Do we need one just for the whole school? Do you imagine, you know, the amount of people she'd actually need to see? And this is where. As unfavorable as it sounds, this is why I think we need to bring in the private sector as well. Um, and bring in things such as social enterprises and ch charities that actually provide that support because it's cheaper. And also these, you know, I've, I've worked alongside social enterprises, they are fantastic. They provide the same support, but have actually got, you know, the education to provide it and the resources to give. Um, so I, I would always favor that against a school nurse, although it would, you know, in a utopian society, it'd be great to have, you know, a school nurse in every single year. I think definitely, you know, it's, 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 it's not going to be feasible at this particular juncture. Not to say it can't be, you never know. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> just, uh, very bullish. just to play off something you mentioned in one of your replies, mm. do you think the sort of, I would say distraction, but the diminishing of any sort of community spirit over the past 50 or so years, do you think that's had an impact on people's mental health? Or certainly yeah. early diagnosis? Definitely, 100%. Uh, I, th I think, uh, you know, we live in silos now, um, and it's not just London anymore. Um, you know, even in Newcastle, which I once thought was the friendliest place on earth, I go on the metro maybe once, or and no one talks to me, it's like I'm back in London. Because literally, there is the community, the diminishing community um, has had you know, a huge effect on you know, going to community hubs in which you can meet your local community, working as a group. Um, that's always gonna have an effect on your well-being because actually you don't feel part of anything. You feel like you're working in your own bubble, in your own situation. So that definitely is having an effect. I wouldn't say it causes mental health problems, but I definitely would say it contributes. It's a contributing factor. Um, because, you know, it's like someone who doesn't have any hobbies. You know, if you, don't, if you literally um, keep to yourself, you're going to be end up becoming very lonely, and I think a lot of people feel quite lonely, and that's why I'm sure, I think the government's got a minister for loneliness now. Is that? I think they have, yeah. A minister for loneliness. I think the government's got now, <coughs> and that's because the levels of loneliness is uh, is rising. So that's an area um, definitely that that I think causes these issues. Serene Serene Rivlin Sanders, St Chad's College. 
Um, you, I think you mentioned briefly at the start about social media and obviously linking off that last question. Mm. Do you think that the rise of social media has had an effect particularly on young people's health? Mental health, sorry. I think so. Yeah, I, I, I always say that I think social media needs to get a moral backbone. Um, I think probably, um, even in my own, my own story, I'll allude to my own story, uh, you know, I, one of the reasons I started getting fixated on the way I looked was because I put photos online and individuals at a click of a button could say, you look like this, or you look like that, or you look like that. Um, I've even had someone say I look like Donald Trump for God's sake. <laughs> Cut the hair, maybe. Um, but you know, that can have a really detrimental effect. And I think the rise of um, you know, social areas such as Instagram, um, you know, you go on there, you'll see loads of people with six packs, um, people with flawless skin. It's not just walking down the high street anymore, you can actually see this. So I think there is a link between body image issues and social media, but also I think there's a there's a sad truth about social media that um, there's a high level of bullying, I think, goes on on social media um, that hasn't completely been unearthed yet, um, but definitely. I, I, I think social media is probably one of the biggest factors of this particular generation's um, mental health and, and one of the most disruptive factors in the mental health, definitely. And don't take selfies. <laughs> Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on sort of the way that the structure is very separate? You sort of mentioned about how NHS is very separate from the schools and mm. the private charities are sort of on their own. Mm. And from personal experience, I've sort of been bounced around a few yeah. different places without really getting anywhere substantial or sort of been provided with the actual support that I was looking for from many of them. Mm. So how are they so separate and like where is the funding coming from? Where is like how did it become so disjointed? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, right, so one of the biggest issues, uh, what I was alluding to when I, I talked about that was the fact that um, the communication between, for example, schools and NHS Trust is not very good. Um, and the reason for that is because of governance arrangements, so safeguarding as such, trying to get the information of a pupil to share with another, another um, side is very difficult within the NHS. But actually sharing that information can very much help in supporting individuals. And I think the reason it's got so disjoint is because of this sort of panic, and I, I, don't worry, I, I support safeguarding, but I think it's there is a level of safeguarding within the NHS, which means that individuals and individual areas can't transfer information to each other um, succinctly, um, and that has you know an interesting effect because you talked about um, obviously you don't have to you don't have to say anything you don't you don't want to, but you know a lot of people find that actually bouncing on the system. I bounced on the system a lot. You know, they suddenly think you've got this, so they bounce somewhere else. And then you have to wait a little bit for that, then you have to bounce somewhere else. So I think that's an issue very much with resources, but also with the understanding around mental health. And I think we've still got a lot more to do. Um, research, and understanding to actually really find the correct treatments and the right treatments um, for individuals. Does that answer your question? Um, I was wondering a bit more about resource allocation, because you mentioned yeah. that the waiting lists are very long, mm. and I sort of experienced part of what you spoke on when you were talking about um, other people you had spoken to, where they said that their conditions at the time just simply weren't severe enough, yeah. um, mm. and without getting into too yeah. many details, that was sort of my experience, I was sort of bounced from GP yeah. to university practitioner to... Yeah. A private group that can talk on changes. Yeah. Um, where basically at the end of it, it came to because of how limited we are in our resources, mm. um, your particular mental health situation isn't severe enough that we can take you in that yeah. moment. Um, and you suggested that I like go to the library and find some books. But I was wondering, how do you bridge the gap between figuring out where the different resources are? Because clearly. Yeah. Nobody knows, and then they just sort of send you off one place and hope that it works out. Yeah, 
I mean, I, I think when it comes just to what you first said about allocation of resources and risk as possible, um, the allocation of resources is decided through clinical commissioning groups who then decide where that money goes. It's, it, it's replaced primary care trusts, um, it's the government's initiative. So what happens is um, the government will bring money down to CCGs, CCGs will then decide, it will go out for tender, people will bid for different services, but the CCGs then allocate them services. <coughs> the issue is the children and adolescent mental health budget from central government is actually not ring fenced. So what's been happening with that, them particular resources in certain areas is they've actually been allocated <coughs> to plug a hole in another area. Um, so the money that actually looks like it's going to our children and mental health service when it gets CCG level is actually being put in another area because it's not <coughs> ring fenced. Um, so that's one of the biggest issues with allocation. Um, I think my best answer about actually, you talked about being bounced around to different services and the communication around that. Um, the problem is there's not a joint up approach between these services. The private sector is very separate to the public sector. You, you know, you, you, I guess you can be transferred to private sector awards at a very high cost. Um, but yeah, and then finally, just quickly, on the idea, you know, I've heard stories of people with eating disorders who are going to get support and they're pretty much told you have to become more unwell before we'll actually give you support. So your, your um, BMI has to become lower before we'll actually provide any love support. Seems a bit odd. You tell someone to get ill before you can actually give help. But that's the be all and end all. And um, unfortunately, we don't have unlimited resources. But I feel with a small change in picture, we can actually help a lot more people. And I think it, it's not as complex. I mean, if I can understand it, believe me, everyone can understand it. Um, but it's just the spending money part, which is quite difficult to provide up front. Charles Cowan, Brown Robert College. Um, you mentioned it's not necessarily feasible to put a mental health nurse in every school. How then should this support be placed in local schools and at the local level? Yeah. Okay, so the way this would work is it would be put into the, the power of local <coughs> schools to link in with local um, charities, local NHS trusts, and there'll be guidance around that, um, as well as businesses if it's in a bigger built up area. And from year six, this wouldn't be a constant every week thing there would be someone who would come in, maybe the local charity would come in one week and say, okay, this is, this is on this particular issue. Then the next week, maybe a social enterprise would come in and, and talk about this particular issue. And you gather that throughout the year. But the buildup of expertise among young people would be great and it would cover everyone. The issue around the nursing part is not only that it's expensive, but actually there's one nurse. You could probably only afford one nurse per school. And yet again, it's the issue of lack of resources, a high number of pupils. Whilst with this approach, everyone gets included. So one week could be year six, next week year seven, and then next week year ten. And I've seen it done in schools, and I'll, the feedback that they get from it is fantastic. They say after a couple of sessions, they find people are educated enough that they're asking more questions, and they're actually completely, um, they've seen improvement in uh, the way they're acting, their, their levels, and they find that they can actually find a solution to their problems instead of actually panicking and reaching crisis points. So, it does work, I, I believe it does work. It's, uh, I'm, you're obviously entitled to believe what you believe, um, but I think it could potentially be a solution. Does that answer your question? Sean Dostokov. Uh, so you mentioned the figure earlier that you said that ten billion pounds would be required to yeah. solve the issue of, 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 of mental illness mm -hmm. in the UK. But do you believe that mental illness is something you can really just rid of society, or would we just get better at, at mitigating it and more correct? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a that's a really good question. No, I think. Okay. So the, the situation we've got now, pretty much, I'll just do a quick overview. We haven't got enough mental health professionals in the profession. Um, there's many different reasons for that. 
it might be because nurses are now charged £9,250 a year, whereas before they got it for free. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything like that. But what I would say is that with short-term investment, it means that individuals, the service would improve, means more people to, to see people, and, and, and that would mean inevitably that could reduce the expenditure in other areas. So the way it would work is actually invest in mental health services, less people on welfare will suffer mental health services, more likely to get back into work because they're getting help quicker, which means the cost of welfare reduces, and it means less work, uh, less lost work days, so businesses start making more money, um, you know, less people ending up in the prison, saving prison budget. So in, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a Keynes model in the sense that if you invest in the short term, the long term effects will actually sustain that improvement because the money saved from these particular areas can then be reinvested <coughs> back into the service. Does that, does that make sense? And actually it will be sustainable. So it wouldn't just be throwing 10 billion pounds at a problem and saying, well, you know, it'd be very coordinated and very directed at actually training more people up um, which inevitably is a problem at the moment, there's just not enough practitioners to, to deliver the services. Um, so if you do want to go into clinical psychology, no, no, don't do it, it's very stressful. But yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, same person again. Yeah, um, same. How much do you think that the stigma around mental health issues affects the amount of money that can be allocated towards it? Um, do you mm. think like the stigma is in some ways as big a problem as the lack of resources, or do you think that if you have more resources, like how, how or how many mm. or how many of the resources that you're allocating would go towards like finding stigma that people feel more comfortable coming forwards, for example? Yeah. I, I think that we've come such a long way regarding reducing stigma. I mean, like 50 years ago or 60 years ago, apparently, I can't remember, it was 60 years ago there was silence and people were pretty much taken into the countryside and, to, and they had limited rights and th there was an issue with that and it was highly stigmatised. Now we have, stigma's kind of been the victim of its own success in the sense we've reduced stigma a lot but inevitably that means more individuals are willing to come out to seek help, which means more of a burden on services to provide that help. So, although I believe there needs to be a, an allocation to reducing stigma, and you know, stig the re reducing of stigma is, you know, we can do it in, in many creative ways, and I, I've seen some great projects that do, do it in amazing ways, and it's very important. But I think the main problem now is that there's people coming out who because of this you know, anti-stigma campaign, but then they can't get the help they need. So it's great reducing stigma, and I would encourage us to continue to reduce the stigma because there is still a stigma there. But at the same accord, without the services well you know, funded enough to provide the provision, then people are still gonna be unwell, and there's still gonna be a cost, you know, a social cost, and a economic cost as well. So. Can I ask everyone last round of applause, please?